We have a Savior, that's what Advent is all about. Uh, we have Advent hope, we have Advent peace, we have Advent joy, and we have Advent love. Okay. Hey, I was at the Christ child, the last candle. You, did, you thought I lost my place, didn't you? Yeah, we're, we're at the, the Christ uh, child. And, and uh, so we've completed all of these candles of Advent. And so the thing is, after Advent, then what? I mean, it's the day after Christmas, then what? Well, the story goes on. You see, Jesus would go on to live the perfect life. Now, <clears throat> my wife will uh, testify to the fact that I am not perfect. Amen? That was, a, that was a pretty weak amen. I'm really happy about that. <laughs> All right. Yeah. But Jesus lived the perfect life. In fact, in order to live the perfect life, there were certain things he had to do, and they weren't really contingent so much on baby Jesus as upon his parents. The law required that baby Jesus be circumcised on the eighth day. And so the text tells us on the eighth day that he was the perfect child, and he's fulfilling the law, and it's dependent upon his parents. On the eighth day, when it was time to be circumcised, he was named Jesus. It says, the name the angels had given him before he had been conceived. And uh, the angel came to Joseph in the dream and said, you will call him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And so he's circumcised. That's the day they named the child officially. He is now Jesus, which means Jehovah saves, and he is the Savior. He's the perfect child. The next thing that happens is he is dedicated now, from time to time, we have baby dedications, but there was also a dedication of the child, uh, Jesus. In fact, we read in Luke chapter 2, verse 22 there, it says, when the time of their purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Joseph took Mary and, took him and, and Jesus to Jerusalem and presented him to the Lord. Here's what's going on. The purification law is required. That after the eight days and he was circumcised, then the, the mother was still unclean for 33 days. Now, when you add this up, there's 41 days, but it says after that, so it was on the 42nd day. On the 42nd day, Mary finally, because she's been ceremonially unclean. Now, what does that mean? It just simply means, not that not she's sinful, we're all sinners, but ceremonially unclean meant you could not approach the Lord in your uncleanness. You had to pause and get yourself together before you could go before the Lord. An unclean person couldn't go into the temple. You had to wait your period of time. It was all ceremonial, cleanness. So now he fulfilled this time, this little time span. They take, take him up to, to Jerusalem, and they present herself as ceremonially clean. Now, Joseph, it says there, so he's probably involved because there probably was no midwife involved when Jesus was born. And so he is unclean for t dealing with her blood issues. And so he is uh, included in this day of purification. They go up according to the law. They're fulfilling the law. And they present Jesus. This is uh, like child dedication. And from time to time, we have a child dedication here. I'm hoping in the month of January, we're going to have another child dedication. Okay, another child dedication. But he is, he's, he's dedicated according to the law. Sometime before he's two years old. We don't know the exact time. But the Magi are made their journey because they've seen the star and they come to, to Jerusalem. They talk to Herod and Herod says he didn't know about king being born. And he asked the, the scribes, where, where is he to be born? They look up Micah and they find that in the book of Micah he's going to be born in Bethlehem. And so he sends them on to Bethlehem and the, the Magi, when they arrive and, and on coming to the house, it says they, the Magi, saw the child and the mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Notice he's no longer in the manger. He's no longer in the cave. He's no longer in the stable, however you take that. But he's now in a home. And so sometime later, the Magi arrive, and they bring him gifts, and they worshipped him. Now, these were Magi. We get the word magician out of it. It comes from the Chaldeans. Uh, back in the days of Daniel, 
the magi, the mag magicians, the soothsayers, the wise men, and Daniel and his buddies were all consulted to give information to the king. These are the wise, wise men who've been searching the scriptures, who are not in Israel, but they saw the star based on the prophecy in the book of Genesis, and they followed the star, and they present him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. He's worshipped. The next thing we know, because Herod now knows that the child is born in Bethlehem and it's a rival king to his kingship, so he wants to make sure that this guy doesn't make it. He sends a decree out to slaughter all the children in Bethlehem from two years old and younger. Why two years old? Because there's somewhere in that span he knows this Christ child has been born, the, th the threat to his throne. And so he, he's... He's been slaughtering, he's going to slaughter the children, but the angel warns Joseph to get up, take the child and his mother, and they take their flight to Egypt. They go down into Egypt, and then after, it says where they stayed until the death of Herod. When death of Herod occurred, he takes them back home, only this time home is in Nazareth, and where he is going to grow up under his stepfather, Joseph, who was a carpenter. He's a devout man. We know that because he was going to put away Mary when he found out she was pregnant, not married, li literally married to him. They've never had uh, sex, and so couldn't be his child. And, and the Bible says he was, a, he was going to divorce her because he was a righteous man. But then God appeared to him and told him, don't do this. What's born in her is, uh, of, of what's been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and he stays on. Well, every year he's going to Jerusalem, because three times in the year, every male has to go up to Jerusalem, and one of them is Passover. And so they're all going up to, to Jerusalem for the Passover, and, and they take Jesus along. Only Jesus is now 12 years old. And, and, you know, they usually travel in a caravan from Nazareth, and they're going up to Jerusalem, and uh, they, they celebrate the Passover. And on the way back, Joseph thinks Mary ha has Jesus, and Mary thinks Joseph has Jesus, or somebody in, in the family crowd's got Jesus, and on the way they go... And uh, two days into their journey, they realize, hey, where's Jesus? <laughs> now, I know what this is like. So one day, I decided to take my son, who's a preschooler, to church with me for the day and give my wife a break. And so I take him with me, and uh, he's uh, been getting a little tired, so I lay him down for a nap, and it's about lunchtime. I hop, go ahead and hop in the car, drive home, and I, uh, I say, okay, I'm ready for lunch. He says, uh, where's Jonathan? I said, what do you mean? She said, uh, you took him with you. I said, oh, no. He's at the church in the crib, sleeping. You know, I, I put him down in the, it was a large crib. I put him down there to sleep. I run out, jump in the car, racing back, man. Sure enough, he's still sound asleep, wake him up. He doesn't even know this ever happened in his life. <laughs> so, Mary and Joseph have lost Jesus. Come on, how do you lose Jesus? This is the Son of God. And so, hey, the men, they're making tracks back. They get to Jerusalem, and they're hunting everywhere, and he's in the temple, and he's surrounded. No wonder they didn't see him. He's surrounded by the theologians of the day, and they're quizzing Jesus. Man, 12 years old, and he's answering their questions in such a profound way. Why? This is the Son of God. You know, as I've said before, I'm sure glad he wasn't my big brother. Man. Why don't you act like your brother? <laughs> Jesus is there, and they said, Jesus, you're causing us all this worry. He said, what are you worried about? Didn't you know I must be about my father's business? Jesus, as a boy, knew he was on a mission. Isn't that amazing? He knew he was on a mission to please his father in heaven. So they took Jesus, and then he, this is the text, then he went down to Nazareth with them, and he was obedient to them. That just blows my mind. God Almighty, come in the flesh, is obedient to Mary and Joseph. Wow. He submitted to those who were less than he was. For the plan of redemption. The Bible tells us that we are to submit to authorities that are over us. So I'm driving down the road and I get 
cart behind me has got lights flashing. And you know what that means? That means your heart races. <laughs> you know, your heart races. I pull over, and uh, out comes this officer. And I look up, and it's a woman officer. And she's got purple eyes. Not because she'd been hit in the eye and got bruises. No, she's got contact lenses that are purple. And I look at her eyes, and I say, wow, those are amazing eyes. <laughs> it just jumped out at me. She, no, now she thinks I'm trying to butter her up, you know? And so, <laughs> and so I, I say, okay, I said, um, uh, she says, uh, can I have your registration? And she says, do you know what I pulled you over for? I said, I have no idea. She said, you have expired license plates. <laughs> I'm driving like six months. On, I mean, I didn't even think about changing my tabs on the plates. And so we talked a little bit. She told me, well, okay, I'm going to let you off, and, and, and you, can, you can go. But uh, I was obedient. I was um, submissive to her as if she was of higher authority than me, which she was. And when she asked me for my license, I forked it over. I forked over my registration. Now, the fact that Jesus places himself under the authority of Mary and Joseph doesn't mean he is inferior at all. He is always superior. The whole idea to be submissive, the whole idea to be obedient, does not mean you are less or smaller than the person you are obedient to. This is really important when it comes to the Christian doctrine of marriage, where it says, submit to one another, wives submit unto your husbands, husbands love your wives. It's not saying you're less important. It's just saying for the economy of God's redemption, what he wants to do in your life, in your marriage, you who may be far more important and wiser and smarter and talented, place yourself under the authority of someone else. God placed himself under the authority of Mary and Joseph. Jesus did as a 12-year-old boy. I know that at that point, he was already smarter than Mary and Joseph combined. <laughs> he was smarter than all those professors of theology in the temple. And Jesus places himself under their authority. He lives the perfect life. We're not told much from the time he's 12 until the time he's 30. Scripture said it was about 30 that he entered into the ministry. When it says about 30, it doesn't mean 31 or 29. It means he was 30 in our way of counting. Now, if they had said that he was 30 and not about 30, and the way they were counting it, it would have been his birthday because there's only one time that you are 30. It would have been on your birthday. After that, you're 30 plus one day. You're 30 plus two days. And so when it said about 30, it meant he was 30 years old, the way we think. Jesus, something happens in his 30th year of his life. God the Father finally tells him, it's time, everything is set. I want you to go down and see your cousin who is, being, who is baptizing people in the Jordan River. Go down there and, and listen to him. And as he is going down, he's going to be anointed by John the Baptist, who, who is a priestly descent to, and he's going to, he's going to be anointed into his ministry. Now we're no longer talking about the perfect infant, the perfect child. We're talking about the perfect man. He's the perfect man. You see, when John sees him coming, he says, uh, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Wow. John's in the river, you know, and he's been baptized, and he sees him. He says, I I'm not even worthy to unlatch the sandals on his feet. Wow. Wow. He's the sinless Lamb of God. That's what Peter tells us. John tells us he's the Lamb of God. Peter tells us he's, he's a lamb without blemish and defect. A lamb without blemish or defect. The priest would examine the sacrifice, and if it had any blemish or defect, it was rejected. And then for Jesus to be the Lamb of God, he's got to be absolutely perfect without defect. After Jesus is declared to be the, the Lamb of God by John the Baptist, he's led into the wilderness to be tempted. He is sinless, though. For the Bible says in Matthew, when he was led into the, by the Spirit uh, in, <coughs> into the desert to be tempted by the devil, 
every time a temptation comes. Now, Luke's account says he was tempted a full 40 days, and Matthew just focuses on three temptations of all the temptations that were going on. And of those three temptations, Jesus responds every time with, it stands written. And he quotes a passage from the scriptures. I cannot, I cannot emphasize enough how important the Bible is to your spiritual life. Jesus knew the scriptures. He quotes the scriptures. And every time he's tempted, when the devil came knocking at his door, he sent the scriptures to answer it. And every time... Satan comes knocking at your door. You need to take Jesus and the scriptures to answer it. To answer it. You just answer, answer the door. Listen, he, he was sinless through the temptation, and it says he had no sin. In the book of Hebrews, it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are yet without sin. Yet he was without sin. Now this is taken by people in two different ways that temptation uh, comes to him. That he was just successful over every temptation that came in his life. And that is true. That when temptation came, he did not give in. He did not give in. He did not give in. And that is true. But there's a second way that this is taken. Yet was without sin as being a reference to the fact that he had no sin nature. The Bible calls him the second Adam. You and I have a sin nature. Adam did not. He was not created with a sin nature. Do you realize he had no evil impulse inside of him? There was no, no, no desire to do wrong. Every temptation came from outside of him. That's why the serpent used the woman and the apple and all of that and, and brings him to the point where, what are you going to do? Are you going to choose the woman and the apple and join her and fall? Or are you going to resist it? And, and he had no impulse within. He made his own deliberate choice to sin. Jesus is the second Adam. And through the virgin conception, he's conceived without sin. So he has no, no inner sinful nature like you and I have. So every, every temptation came from without him. And like the, the first Adam, he, unlike him, he doesn't cave in. He lives the perfect, sinless life. He is absolutely, totally without sin. So the question becomes, could Jesus have sinned? And that's a theological question that's usually asked at every ordination council. Could Jesus have sinned? And the answer is absolutely not. He did not have a sinful nature. He's the Son of God. Then how could he be tempted? Well, tempting is just attempting to get someone to do something. So every temptation was without him. Now listen. The United States has these huge aircraft carriers. You ever seen one? They are humongous, right? And you could declare, personally, you could declare war on the United States and get in a rowboat and go out with a pea shooter and attempt to take it down. <laughs> you could make the attempt, and that would be a temptation, external temptation, to attack you, and you would never succeed in taking it down. You see, temptation, all external temptation, does not mean I have to yield, that I have to cave. Jesus was like the aircraft carrier and a little pea shooter you know who's going to win this battle. Jesus wins every time. He is the sinless Son of God without sin. Not only did he have no sin, the Bible says he did no sin. He, Jesus, committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. Not only did he have no sin and he did no sin, it says there was no sin in him. But you, yourself, but you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins and in him is no sin. The Bible wants to make it very clear. Jesus is sinless. Why? Because if you're going to die for your sins, and I'm going to die for my sins, I can't die for yours. I've got to die for mine. I need someone that is sinless who will be my substitute and take my place. That's why it is so emphatic in the scriptures that Jesus is the sinless Son of God. Now, Jesus also had a perfect ministry. 
From the time he's 30 until the time he's 33, he's got this perfect ministry. It says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. That's why I believe that when John the Baptist baptized Jesus, he's being anointed of God. Because it says he was anointed with the Holy Spirit. And when he was baptized, the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove. And the Father said, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And Jesus was anointed to his ministry. And he went about doing good. I like that. He went about doing good. And I talked about this just a little bit on, on Christmas Eve. Uh, how part of that doing good is he was picking disciples. And the ones he picked... He's going to entrust his whole ministry in the lives of these disciples. And uh, so he went about doing good. Now, part of doing good, he's got a band of disciples. He's going to pass the ministry on when he's gone. But part of doing good, it tells us that he, he began, it says, at that time Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. He used to puzzle me when I was younger. Well, if it's near, where is it? Where is it? Some people say, well, this kingdom is now spiritual. It's in your heart. I don't think that's what the prophets were talking about in the Old Testament. There was a real, literal kingdom coming. If it's near, what, why, what happened to it? He went through all the Galilee teaching and the synagogues preaching the good news of the kingdom. Where's the kingdom? Well, there's three things for a kingdom. You have to have a king. Jesus was king. He was present, so the kingdom was near. You have to have a people or a subject. If you're a king, but you have no people, you're not much of a king, so you have to have subjects. And so he needs the followers, the people, and then he needs a realm, a territory where he reigns. And Israel was promised. The piece of property was promised in Genesis 15 to Abraham and his seed. And so three things are there, but Jesus, the king is present, and the territory is there, but where are the people? He came unto his own, and his own received him not on that triumphal entry of Jesus. Oh yeah, they're saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, but five days later, they're saying, crucify him, crucify him. We will not have this man to reign over us. They rejected the king, and the kingdom has been postponed. And in the postponement period, Jesus has called together a new people called the church. And when the church age has ended, Jesus will then set up a kingdom that will last for a thousand years. Wow. But the kingdom was at hand because the king was present making a legitimate offer to a people who refused the king. He went about doing good by preaching the gospel. He, it also says, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. He was healing. Now, of all the healings, my favorite is the one the man born blind. You remember that story. You know what I like about it so much? They ask, the disciples ask, what happened to this man that he was born blind? Is it his parents' fault or his fault? And Jesus said it was neither one, but it was so that he could show the work of God. And then he spit on the ground. I love this part. He spit on the ground. Every now and then I just spit. I just want to spit. Get that extra saliva out of your mouth, spit. And you, know, you watch it on the ground. In the wintertime it'll freeze, you know, and Hard to mix then, but you spit, and he, and he spits on the ground. Jesus spits, and then he mixes up a mud, and he sticks it in the guy's eyes. You know, at this point, man, everybody's saying, this is like the craziest, wildest thing. You say, what is wrong with Jesus? Uh, and, and, but he's anointing the man's eye with his own spit, his spittle, and, and the dirt of the ground, and he tells the man, go wash, and you'll be clean. Oh, my goodness. I, I could hitchhike to other stories in the Bible that just blow my mind, like Naaman the leper. And uh, when, God, when, when Elijah told him, hey, go dip in the, the, the Jordan River uh, seven times, and he's thinking, what's wrong with the rivers back in Damascus? Why do I got to do it in the dirty river of the Jordan? And, and, but he goes and he dips. Can you imagine dipping in the water? He dips, he dips one time and nothing on it, because he, he had leprosy, and the leprosy would go away if he dipped seven times. He, he looks at, oh, it's still there. He dips a second time, a third time. Oh, he's still got the leprosy, four or five. He's still got it there. Six times, it's still there. He could have quit. But he dips the seventh time, and pff, it's gone. Now, come on. This is the miraculous. That's what Jesus is doing, going around doing miraculous things. He tells him to go wash the the spit and dirt off his eyes, and when he does, the blind man could see. And we get that in that song, I once was lost, but now I'm fine, was found, but was blind, but now I see. He, he, he could see. 
the rest of the story is what intrigues me, and I don't have time to go over all the details. But they ask him one after the other, how'd this happen? How'd this happen? How'd this happen? And, and every time he gives an answer, they don't like that answer. And, and, and finally he has to, you know, he just has to say, I don't know, I'm not a theologian. This is what I know. I once was blind, but now I see. You can't argue with that. And that is how we testify of our faith. I don't have to have all the answers for a possible objection to my Christian faith. I've got one that they cannot deny. Jesus Christ came into my life and he changed my life and you know it. And you know it. I am different. You know it. You know. It. That's what I like about that miracle. There's so much more I could talk about. It. But Jesus made the perfect sacrifice. You see, John the Baptist started at the beginning of his ministry and said, Behold, look at the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Well, how could he do that? Well, as our high priest, it says, For this is the reason he had to be made like his brothers in every way. He's talking about the incarnation. Before this, he was talking about an angel won't do. An angel cannot die for you. So God had to become flesh. He had to be made like his brothers in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God and that he might make an atonement. The word there is literally propitiation. We've covered that a few times. He'll make a propitiation for our sins of the people because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. Oh my goodness. I could hitchhike from here and we could be preaching till midnight about the life of Jesus. Jesus can help you when you're tempted. Here's what you do when you're tempted. I dare you to do this. Just get on your knees and pray. Because you won't be tempted while you're praying. Because he is able to help those who are being tempted. In fact, in the fourth chapter, it tells us that he's gone into heaven and he will help you in the time of your temptation when you pray. You get on your knees. Now, when you get up and walk away, you might be tempted again. You just got to get down and pray because it'll go away. It'll go away. It'll go away. He's our high priest. He does that. Listen. This high priest, unlike other high priests, he does not need to offer a sacrifice day after day. In the Old Testament, the political system, the priest went in every day and offered a sacrifice for the sins of the people. And then one time of the year, he would offer a sacrifice, not just for the sins of the people, but for his own very sins. And then he would go into the Holy of Holies with that blood and sprinkle it on the mercy seat, the propitiation place, to satisfy the outraged holiness of God for sin. And that's what Jesus, the text says here, he didn't have to do it day after day, first for his own sin and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. Wow. Jesus on the cross cried out, it is finished. It is finished. The words are in the Greek to telestai. It's perfect tense. It says it stands having been finished and the results are still abiding. That's all wrapped up in that word. And the word, it is finished, means paid in full. It's like you made the last payment on your car, and they stamp, paid in full. You get the title, it's yours now. He has paid in full the debt of our sins when he offered himself up as an offering for sin once for all. So he doesn't have to go in time and time again. He himself is our sacrifice. It says, when he offered himself... This is the difference between him and the Old Testament priests. The Old Testament priests, every time they'd go in, they'd offer an animal sacrifice. But Jesus as priest offers himself as the sacrifice to take away the sin of the world. It says a little bit later in the book of Hebrews, just as it is destined to die once, I'm glad it said just once. I hope we don't, I don't want to have to repeat this. Some people did. Lazarus in the Bible had to repeat it. He died a second time. I only got to do this once, just as it is destined to die once, and after this to face the judgment. So there was, so, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sin of many. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for Him. Listen, it's already talking about the second coming of Christ here. He said the first time He comes, He comes as a sacrificial victim. The second time He comes, He comes as ruling King. And Jesus is coming again. This perfect sacrifice is actually proved by the resurrection. In the book of Romans, chapter 4, verse 25, it says, He was delivered over for the, uh, to death for our sins. Jesus died for my sins. He took my place. It was my sin that put him on the cross because he's the sinless one. 
And he was raised to life for our justification. This literally for our righteousness. Jesus bought my righteousness on the cross. His, his goodness, his righteousness, his perfection was imputed. It was charged to my account. So God looks down from heaven and sees me as a believer in Jesus. Perfect. Wow, is that great? And he sees you that way too. He sees you that way. He was raised because he accomplished that. If he had not accomplished that, he would have remained in the grave. My final point, I'm running out of time. Jesus offered the, offers the perfect future. I know that because of what happened on the cross. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at Jesus. Aren't, aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and save us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God? Since you are under the same sentence, we're punished justly. There's confession. I'm a sinner. <laughs> we're punished justly. And we're getting what our deeds deserve. The wages of sin is death. Hey, I'm here and I deserve this. But this man has done nothing wrong. He sees the sinless of, sinlessness of Jesus. Something spoke to him about the way he was being crucified that he realized that Jesus was an extraordinary person. And he believes in the sinlessness of Jesus Christ. I think that's amazing. Then he said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. This is just full of theology here. Oh my goodness. He's saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He believes he's the king. He's going to have a kingdom. He's going to be resurrected from the dead. He's going to be alive. But wow, listen to this. This man is a true believer. I mean, where he got all this theology? On the cross, I don't know. But he, he becomes a believer, and then Jesus says, and he answers him, and he says, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. Wow. You see, their bodies were going to die, and the body would then go into the ground of the, the thieves. But this man's spirit was going to be going to paradise, to heaven. In the future resurrection, his body is going to be raised from the grave and a spirit brought back to be reunited and to be forever and ever with Christ. And that's the way it is for all of us. That's the way it is for all of us. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, and I say, would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. <laughs> he told that thief, you're going home today. You're going home with me. You're going home with me. Wow. I want you to take this with you today. Advent was just the beginning of the life of Christ. It was just the beginning. The story of Jesus continues on, even beyond his resurrection, it continues on today. We are the church of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I will build my church. Jesus is active in the church. And the church is not this building. The church is the people. The story continues. The Advent story continues. We are awaiting the second Advent of Christ. He came the first time as a baby. He's coming the second time, just as the scripture said. The, they, the disciples saw him being taken up in the clouds in the air, and he said, the angels appeared and said, what are you looking up into heaven for? The same Jesus is coming back the same way you have seen him go. He is coming back. He is coming back. This is what I want, to take, want you to take with you. Until he returns, live for him. Live for him. Live for Jesus. That's what the Advent is all about. Let's pray. Father, we're very thankful for the birth of Christ. And Lord, we're very thankful that uh, you gave your son. And then we're thankful for the crucifixion where your son gave his life. We're thankful for the resurrection where Christ gives us life. Thank you, O oh God. We pray, Lord, today that we will go and live, live out our belief in this Advent and this life that is found in Christ, that many will see it and fear and trust in the Lord. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen.